a charming and spirited young mother. Oh, she was so vivacious, like a little firecracker. She was sweet and loving, but she just didn't take any crap off anybody. Is found strangled in her bedroom. Whoever did this left her there with no chance to survive. Police face a challenging crime scene. There was no forensic evidence whatsoever. No fingerprints. No eyewitnesses. This case was a definite whodunit case. And a long list of suspects. He had been hanging around her desk and he had made some comments that really creeped her out. She had had some troubled boyfriends in the past. He didn't want to accept the fact that they were done. Their relationship was over. You would think that whoever did it had a score to settle. Until one big break reveals a culprit. That one key piece of evidence was the aha moment in the case. And it shocks everyone. When they finally discovered who it was, it was just surreal. There's no rhyme, there's no reason behind it. It was absolutely senseless. Just before 5 p.m. on a Monday in March of 1999, in the small bedroom community of Norcross, Georgia, police raced through the suburban streets in response to a 911 call. The only information that we had at hand initially was there had been a uh, person discovered dead in an apartment. It was her fiancé that had called 911. When we arrived at the scene, we spoke with the fiancé briefly. The man tells detectives the victim is 20-year-old mother of one, Danielle Jennings. Her two-year-old son is currently at daycare. The fiancé told us he walked in and found her lying on the bed, and he stated that she was cold and blue. She was deceased by that point. She was face down on the bed, and he rolled her over and then called 911. While Danielle's fiancé is taken to provide a statement, investigators take a close look at the crime scene went back into the bedroom, she was on the bed, fully clothed, laying on her back, but you could obviously see its signs of strangulation. She had a, a ligature around her neck. The ligature appeared to be some type of stocking, and it was tied around her neck very, very tight. It had been tied off to leave it that way. It's not like it released, which I thought was pretty unusual. I mean, whoever did this left her there with no chance to survive. The ligature was knotted in, in the back, which would tell you that the person was on her back behind her when she was strangled. Detectives explore the rest of the crime scene, looking for clues. The bed was messed up. One of the dresser drawers was open. The stocking that she was strangled with may have been one of hers out of that drawer. Her purse was dumped out as if somebody had dumped the contents and rummaged through it. It could have been a robbery or a burglary just gone wrong. However, there was other stuff such as cameras, miscellaneous jewelry that could have been taken but they were not taken. It was possibly a burglary that had been interrupted, but you always have to consider the possibility that it could have been a staged burglary because, frankly, there really wasn't a lot of disruption. Next, investigators try to determine how the killer entered the apartment. There was absolutely no tool marks or anything on the front door, and then there was a sliding patio glass door it was locked. There was no evidence of tampering with it at all. We went around and we searched the outside, but we didn't turn up anything of any value. Before they returned to the station to interview Danielle's fiance, detectives fan out to speak with other tenants in the complex. Most of the people in these complexes work during the day, and so most of them are not home. We left our business cards with a note asking them to please give us a call. As the crime scene investigation continues, 
news of Danielle's violent murder quickly spreads to her family and friends. When I found out that Danielle died, I said, no, I said, you've got to be kidding me. I said, this, this cannot be real. And then I was, I just, I just, I dropped the phone and I just started screaming. <sighs> I was just absolutely in utter shock. How does one handle the information that your best friend, your sister, the person that you basically love more than anybody in this world is gone? Why would somebody do this to such a loving, caring, beautiful person? Born in Columbia, South Carolina in 1978, Danielle grew up with her mother and stepfather in Stockton, Georgia. Even in her youth, Danielle had a magnetic personality. She was beautiful, uh, strong, tenacious, ferocious. <laughs> she was very fun. Danielle was always ready to have a good time, to laugh. Oh, she was so vivacious, like a little firecracker. She was very tiny, but she had this big attitude. She was sweet and loving, but she just didn't take any crap off anybody. Danielle showed her resilience when she was left to deal with an unplanned pregnancy alone at the age of 16. There was never a doubt in her mind that she wanted to have that baby. She wasn't scared. I mean, she had brass balls of steel. She wasn't going to let her age stand in the way of being a good mother. Danielle gave birth to her son, Tristan, in 1996. She was so proud. I could see her little attitude in him. The new mother longed for her son to have a father and hoped she had found one when she started dating Luis Payano. We grew up with Luis, so we go way back with him. We met Luis in our early teen years. Danielle was always partial to Luis. And Louis and Danielle were dating. I was so thrilled. And the way that Louis would look at Danielle, like she would walk into the room and he would just light up. Soon, the couple moved into an apartment together and Danielle landed an office job at a landscaping company. She was so excited to have like what we titled a big girl job. She was very proud of herself. We were all very proud of her, you know? She was going places. In December of 1998, Luis asked Danielle to marry him. She was so excited, and I'm like, this is going to be the best marriage ever. When Danielle first got her engagement ring, it was too big. And I said, girl, I said, you got to get it sized. She's like, I don't want to take it off. It was beautiful. Danielle had everything going for her. She had a great career opportunity ahead of her. She had a man she was so excited to marry. She had a beautiful son that just meant the world to her. Danielle was really on top of her game. She was probably the happiest I had ever seen her. Now, all Danielle's happiness and hope has been stolen by a cold-blooded killer. I could not even begin to fathom why somebody would do that to her. Back at the crime scene, investigators are searching for answers. The scene raised several questions. Of course, the most obvious was how did whoever it was get into the apartment? Because there was no sign of forced entry. Was it someone she knew? We know, working off the percentages, that the person most likely to kill you is laying next to you in the bed. In this case, Danielle's fiance, Louise. Coming up, detectives unearth dark secrets. She had had some troubled boyfriends in the past. He was violent. He was abusive. You could tell when he talked about Danielle that it made him mad. He was just very, very creepy to me. And I know they had tumultuous fights. The person that did it could have been amongst us. And just as the case threatens to turn cold... We felt like we had hit a brick wall. I had a huge fear that whoever it was got away with it. A stunning revelation points to a killer no one suspected. The killer was much closer to home than anybody first thought. I don't think anybody saw it coming.
Police investigating the murder of 20-year-old mother, Danielle Jennings, have their first suspect, her fiancé, 25-year-old Luis Piano. Even though he's her fiancé, everybody remains a suspect and until such time that we solve the crime. Investigators question the distraught young man. He was very emotional, but romance can raise anger to a level sometimes that, that leads to homicide. Detectives begin their interview by asking Louise about Danielle's movements the day of her murder. He stated that he had been at work all day. The last time he had seen Danielle was when he left to go to work. According to Luis, they had both left the apartment at 6.45 a.m., but Danielle went back into the building to get something. He tells detectives that Danielle seemed distracted because of an upcoming work meeting. She was supposed to be having a meeting with management that day. She didn't feel easy about it. Luis says Danielle called him at work around 11.30 a.m. She wanted to see if Luis would have lunch with her, but he was tied up at work and he couldn't break free. They didn't have lunch, and later in the afternoon, he couldn't reach her. He called her at work, and then they told him that she had gone home at lunchtime, but she didn't come back from lunch after a couple of hours. Luis tells investigators he called Danielle's cell phone and their apartment. He stated that you know, he was trying to get hold of Danielle and was not getting a response, and then he left work and went home to see if she was there. Luis said that when he got home, the front door was unlocked, and that really surprised him because they were pretty careful about keeping the front door locked. Detectives ask Luis about his relationship with Danielle. We wanted to find out if they had domestic issues. He said that it was a very good relationship and they were very much in love with each other. To verify his story, detectives call Luis's work and Danielle's loved ones. Her family and friends stated that they were just a young couple that was very much in love and looking forward to getting married and spending their life together. She had had some troubled boyfriends in the past. But Lewis was on the up and up. I mean, he was setting up a financially stable life for him and Danielle and Tristan. And she loved him so much. Danielle's friends are adamant that Luis would never harm her. And his alibi seems solid. We were able to confirm that he had been at work all day uh, through statements of his co-workers. As a result, he was eliminated as a suspect. Now you're on the hunt for other suspects. With Luis in the clear, detectives ask him if he knew of anyone who may want to harm Danielle. He brought up the name of Jeff, a co-worker of Danielle. She had filed a sexual harassment complaint against him at work. That uh, piqued our interest a little bit. We immediately went to Danielle's place of work and we met with her supervisor and discussed what was going on. Danielle's supervisor tells detectives about the young mother's harassment complaint against her co-worker. He was a middle-aged man. He worked at the same landscape company. He had a different job. He was in management. Danielle told her manager and supervisor he had been hanging around her desk and he had made some comments that really kind of creeped her out and acting inappropriately at work. There was a big age difference between Danielle and Jeff. He was 40, she was 20. He had asked her out for lunch and she told him that she had a fiance that she loved and uh, he had made a comment to her that if he was 20 years younger, things would be a lot different. Danielle had briefly touched base with me about the situation that she was having at work. Dude was kind of crushing on her, and she was trying to get that, you know, under control. But I said, just don't, you know, don't let it get out of hand. She filed the complaint. I kind of admired her grit. She wasn't going to take it. The company was very responsive to her complaint. They took it seriously. They moved quickly. Detectives note the timing when told of the company's response. 
that day that uh, Danielle was killed, she was supposed to be having a meeting with upper management about the sexual harassment charge. Once we realized that the meeting had taken place that day, that was something that was suspicious. Talking with the management, we found out Danielle was anxious and nervous about the meeting. She was a relatively new employee when she made the complaint. That was one of the reasons she was so nervous, because his career was in a certain amount of jeopardy. Co-workers state that after the meeting, Danielle went home for lunch, but never returned. She didn't come back, and we knew that was consistent with the, the time of death. You had to think, where was the co-worker at the time? Detective suspicions increase when they learn that Jeff was out of the office and did not return until late in the day. Was this too much of a coincidence? Could he have killed Danielle as revenge for her complaint? We definitely wanted to speak with him face to face. Detectives hunting the killer of Danielle Jennings suspect a harassment complaint against her co-worker, Jeff, may have led to retaliation and murder. We were now focused on him as a possible suspect. We had to consider the possibility that he followed her home and ambushed her and killed her. Investigators bring the 40-year-old in for an interview and ask about his interaction with 20-year-old Danielle. He admitted to asking her out for lunch, but he said other than that, he had not done anything. He talked about the sexual harassment complaint and pretty typically said, you know, I didn't think it was that big a deal. I, I didn't know she was that offended. According to police reports, Jeff denies any sexual intentions toward Danielle. He told police that whatever lapse in manners that he had had with Danielle, that he liked her. He seemed to be genuinely dismayed to find out what had happened. Detectives ask if Danielle's complaint gave him a reason to want to harm her. His first reaction was he was angry. He was adamant that he was not a suspect. And then he said, it couldn't have been me because... My truck was broken and I was on a job with somebody else, with a co-worker. And I can prove it. Jeff provides investigators with the name of the co-worker he claims to have been with. We immediately ran down his co-worker at like 1 o'clock in the morning. This guy verified that he was with him all day till the close of business. They were together. With his alibi confirmed... Police eliminate Jeff as a suspect. 24 hours after Danielle's murder, the enormity of her death is only just starting to hit home for Danielle's loved ones. Things like that didn't happen where we grew up. I could not believe somebody would do that to her. It was just the most nightmarish thing I could imagine. It made me question God. Why would you let something that horrible happen to her? I didn't want to accept it. I couldn't sleep. I just kept saying, she's dead, she's dead. Danielle should not be dead. The following day, investigators receive the autopsy report and scour it for anything that might point to Danielle's killer. The manner of death was uh, asphyxiation or strangulation. The medical examiner stated that she probably lost consciousness within about 15 to 20 seconds after the ligature was placed around her neck. It seemed clear that she had been surprised by her attacker, had no time to move, had no time to strike back. It's almost like it came out of nowhere. We knew from the positioning of the knot, someone had come up behind her with the nylon stocking, pulled it tight until she lost consciousness and then tied it off to kill her. She had not been sexually assaulted. There weren't any other injuries. There weren't any defensive injuries. This case was a definite whodunit case. There was no evidence found at the scene that could help us. There was no forensic evidence whatsoever. 
uh, no transfer of skin, no fingerprints, uh, nothing a lab could look at. After striking out with the autopsy, investigators revisit the theory that the homicide was a robbery gone wrong. We don't live there, so we don't know what's supposed to be there and what's not. We asked the fiancé to go back through the apartment with us and tell us what he sees missing. The smallest detail sometimes helps point us into the direction of a suspect, but nothing was missing according to the fiancé. At that point, we had absolutely nothing to go on other than the stocking that she was strangled with Detectives ask Luis if he recognizes the stalking. We wanted to know whether it came from her. It was a tan, knee-high women's stocking, and he said that she never wore anything like that, and we didn't find any in the apartment. Whoever did this brought that with them. The homicide was brutal, violent, and vicious. It lent itself to a personal motive. You would think that whoever did it and had a score to settle. Louise told us she had had some tumultuous relationships in her past, so we pursued that angle. Investigators asked Danielle's friends about her previous relationships. When they first started questioning me, they were asking me a lot of questions about her boyfriends in the past, who I felt might have been able to do it. And then it clicked that, you know, Eddie, he was a tow truck driver, and he was a big guy. And he was just very, very creepy to me. Her best friend told us about her ex-boyfriend. He was violent. He was abusive. She ended up having to get a restraining order on him. But with Eddie, no one ever really knew when he was going to pop up again. That was somebody we needed to look at. Two days after the murder of 20-year-old Danielle Jennings, friends have alerted investigators to Eddie McElwaney, an ex-boyfriend with a violent history. We learned a lot about her former boyfriend. We learned that she had begun to see him when she was a teenager, when she was younger. Friends reveal Danielle started dating Eddie shortly after she became pregnant from another relationship. But Eddie's behavior soon raised red flags. As they got more serious, he became more possessive and controlling, and he definitely wanted to start isolating her from her friends and family more. I didn't want to be around him. I did not like the way he made me feel. I didn't like the way he looked at Danielle. I mean, it was, he would sometimes look at her with, he looked at her with disgust. And I know they had tumultuous fights. We learned it had been a, an abusive relationship, physical and emotional. I mean, she would stand up to anybody, but as tough and as a badass as she was, I think she was a little bit afraid of him. Things only got worse with Eddie when Danielle gave birth to her child. Her family and friends stated that shortly after her son was born, Eddie was getting involved in drugs and that was finally the straw that broke the camel's back and she ended the relationship with that. Danielle moved out and tried to start fresh, but Eddie had other plans. She knew it was going to be difficult, but she didn't realize that Eddie was not going to leave Danielle in peace. He didn't want to accept the fact that they were done. Their relationship was over. She never knew when he would turn up around the corner when she just wanted to be left alone. She had gotten a restraining order against Eddie because he had been stalking her. He had been driving back and forth in front of her house. He had gone to her work, and she was in fear that she was in danger. We found out that he had violated the restraining order several times. He would call her, leave voicemails for her. He would drive by her house several times a day or night. When police ask when Eddie last contacted Danielle, the answer is troubling. Danielle's family had told us that within the last few months, he had been calling her, trying to get her to talk to him, but she would just hang up on him. 
Could Eddie have shown up at Danielle's apartment the day she was killed, leading to a deadly confrontation? I've seen a lot of domestic abuse cases, so I knew that there was a possibility that with his past that he could have done something like that. Investigators track down Eddie and bring him in for questioning. In the interview with Eddie, he was kind of belligerent and unhappy to be there and a little bit hostile. You could tell when he talked about Danielle that it made him mad. What we saw with Eddie certainly had all the earmarks of a domestic violence case. When questioned about his relationship with Danielle, Eddie's responses raised detective suspicions even more. When he was asked about the relationship, his version was a little bit different. He never mentioned any abuse. He thought everything was great. We asked him when was the last time that he had had any contact with Danielle, and he said that he had not talked to her for at least a year or longer. We know that he's lying about that. From speaking with Danielle's family and friends, we knew in the last several months he had been calling her. At that point, he's looking pretty good. So you have to determine where he was at the time of the crime. Eddie tells detectives that he was working many miles away from where Danielle was killed. He said that on his job as a tow truck driver that he had to go out of state. Investigators immediately look into Eddie's alibi. His boss verified that he was out of state and he was able to produce hotel receipts, gas receipts. That showed that he was actually out of state at the time of the crime. Whenever he responded to a legitimate call, he had to log it. And his whereabouts could be verified throughout the day. That is, is a pretty tight alibi, so he was eliminated as a suspect. It's another dead end for detectives. Once again, we're knocked for a loop and we're back to ground zero and he moves down the line and we're looking for somebody else. It was infuriating, it was frustrating. I had a huge fear that whoever it was got away with it because people get away with murder every day. I was really hoping that the detectives would find something. Because you're sitting here trying to point a finger at somebody that you don't know who. There was this air of suspense around everything because we didn't know at that time who had killed Danielle. The person that did it could have been amongst us. We had basically eliminated everybody who was close to the victim. When you get to that point of an investigation, you don't have anywhere else to logically follow up. With no more leads, the investigation is at a standstill. We felt like we had hit a brick wall. And then we got a call that changed everything. Three days after finding Danielle Jennings strangled in her apartment bedroom, police hunting her killer have just got a stunning new lead. We received a phone call from a Miss Kirk that, that resided at the apartment complex. The woman tells detectives about a disturbing incident that took place a week before Danielle was killed. She was awakened one morning by someone knocking at the door and she looked out the peephole but didn't see anybody there, so she went back to bed. And a few minutes later, she hears the front door open and the maintenance man is standing there. The maintenance man says that he's there for a work order. However, Ms. Kirk says she felt very uncomfortable the entire time that he was in there because he was always staring at her, like he was more preoccupied with her than he was completing the work order. The woman cannot provide the name of the maintenance man, but she gives a description to police. Detectives head back to Danielle's apartment complex to investigate. While speaking with the management at the complex, we found that there was another case similar in the past from a Miss Bruno that lived in the apartment complex. Management told the detectives that someone had walked into this woman's apartment 
She, of course, asked him who the heck he was. What are you doing in my apartment? And he said maintenance and claimed that he was there to change light bulbs. And she said, I don't have any light bulbs to change. He kind of mumbled and stumbled and then, you know, maybe I have the wrong apartment. And he backed out and left. It was so similar to the other one, which, of course, raises our eyebrows. The complex was big enough so that there were several maintenance workers, but only one closely fit the description given by the young ladies. That would be Kelvin Oliver. We showed a photograph of Mr. Oliver to Miss Bruno and Miss Kurt, and both of them identified him as the person that had walked in on them. Investigators discover a disturbing trend emerged after Calvin had been hired seven months ago. Come to find out there had been several burglaries reported where items had been stolen out of apartments that had no forced entry. Could Calvin have been responsible for these thefts? We learned that he had an apartment in the complex. The fact that he lives there makes it so accessible that he could walk around, not be suspicious. We also learned that the custodians had access to the master keys of every apartment. He has complete access. Detectives search for any link between Danielle and Calvin. We found out that he had done a work order in her apartment a couple of weeks prior to the murder. That is somebody that you really want to look at. It went back to our original theory of if this was a burglary, then it had been interrupted. He could have known that Danielle Jennings was gone during the daytime, and he decided that day that he was going to enter that apartment. Investigators haul Calvin Oliver in for an interview, but make the call to slow play their suspicions. When Oliver was brought in for questioning, we didn't want to tip him off to anything about the homicide. So he was interviewed initially about the burglaries. He absolutely denied any of that. He, he said, I didn't steal anything. I didn't go into apartments. He denied any involvement in any burglaries. The 42-year-old tells detectives that his intrusion on the two women in the complex was a simple misunderstanding. Once we got around to interviewing him about the murder, the first question was, did you hear about this? It was kind of odd. You would have thought that a person who worked in that apartment complex and was there every day would have heard everything about it. He went, yeah, I think I heard something about it. Uh, you know, I don't know much about it. I don't know that woman. He insisted he knew nothing about, as he described her, that dead girl. All he admitted to knowing her was that he had done the work order in her apartment. At that point, we had a pattern of conduct uh, going into apartments. We had the admission that he had been in the apartment, but we had nothing that directly linked him to the murder. With nothing concrete on Calvin, detectives end the interview. But before they let him walk free, police run a background check and are shocked by what they find. He had a criminal history of burglary and theft. There was an outstanding warrant on him for failure to appear on a burglary charge in another jurisdiction. That day that Danielle was killed, if he's in there and she walks in on him, that would be a reason for him to cause her harm because he doesn't want to go back to prison. He had an outstanding warrant, so he was held for that. And that bought them enough time while they investigated. Based on the burglaries that had occurred in the complex, we obtained a search warrant for his apartment. We're trying to see if we can find anything that would tie him to Danielle Jennings. We're looking for any type of the stockings or pantyhose or anything that would be similar to the one that we found tied around her neck. Detectives find no matching stocking but they do discover incriminating evidence. We do find evidence of the other burglaries that have been committed in the complex. And then we also found out that he had possession of a master key for the apartment complex so that he could open any door on any building at any time. And he was not supposed to be in possession 
of that key. It's only enough evidence to allow investigators to charge Calvin with burglary. We concluded that search with those items, but nothing was found relevant to the murder. You really don't have anywhere else to go at that point. We don't have a stocking. We don't have anything that ties him to Danielle or her apartment at all. That's where we were until Luis called. Out of the blue, he said, do you have the engagement ring? We told him, no, we don't have a ring. We didn't know one was missing. And then he describes the ring, and then the big bright light goes off. When we were doing the search on Oliver's apartment, we noticed a ring bone a dresser in his bedroom, but the ring didn't match any of the items stolen, so we really didn't have a reason to seize it at that time. We do another search warrant, go back into the apartment, we seize that ring, we show it to the fiance. He can't positively identify the ring, but he says her best friend will definitely be able to identify it. If we were able to identify that as being Danielle's ring, that would physically tie Oliver to Danielle and her apartment on the day that she was murdered. With the entire investigation on the line, detectives race to the home of Danielle's best friend. Is that ring the engagement ring? This is something we gotta know. Investigators believe the key to solving the murder of Danielle Jennings is her missing engagement ring. If we had that ring, then we had the killer. Detectives have seized a ring from suspect Calvin Oliver's apartment. But is it Danielle's engagement ring? They hope her best friend can answer that question. The detective and Lewis were there. And uh, I said, well, what's going on? And the detective looked at me and he said, Leslie, he said, do you know what Danielle's engagement ring looked like? And I said, yes, sir, I do. The detective said, is there any defining characteristics to this ring? He goes, and I need you to be specific. And I said, yes, sir. I said it was bent. She had bent the band so it stayed snug on her finger because she wouldn't take the dang thing to get sized. We needed to find out when was the last time she had seen her wearing the ring. I said, I saw Danielle the Sunday before she was killed. And she had a ring on, on Sunday night. And he takes the evidence bag out and he says, is this her ring? And the minute I saw it, I knew it was hers. When we had that ring and had it identified as being hers, we knew that we had the guy. We knew we had the right person. Finding the ring was the aha moment in the case. And that was the piece of evidence that allowed us to charge Calvin Oliver with Burke. Nine days after her death, Calvin Oliver is arrested for the murder of Danielle Jennings. The primary charge was malice murder, and that means that you intentionally and unlawfully kill another human being. Detectives once again interview Calvin, this time taking a different approach. Why don't you have a suspect under arrest for the charge that you're interviewing him about? Then the interview becomes very direct. He was given a chance again to tell the story um, where he denied any involvement in the murder, and then he was confronted with the evidence that we had. We told him about the ring, and that's when he said, well, I stole that ring two weeks ago when I did the work order in her apartment. But see, we knew that was a lie because we had people that had seen her wearing the ring. So we knew that he was lying about that. Calvin refuses to answer any more questions. We told him that he was being charged with malice murder because you took the pantyhose with you into the apartment because you had intent to harm someone. And he said there was no intent there, which was a good comment to have in a statement. It's like he admitted 
to killing her without knowing that he has admitted to it. We were convinced 100% that we had our guy. This is the guy that was responsible for the death of Daniel Jennings and that we were going to send him to prison for the rest of his life. News of an arrest in Danielle's murder brings relief to her loved ones and surprise. When they finally discovered who it was, the maintenance man in her apartment building, it was just surreal. I don't think anybody saw it coming. The killer was much closer to home than anybody first thought. When I saw his picture, I just, I threw up, knowing that that was the man that it strangled my best friend for no reason. At trial, prosecutors present how they believe the crime unfolded. The day Daniel was killed, Mr. Oliver had already let himself in, hoping for financial gain. After the HR meeting about her co-worker, Danielle went home for lunch by herself. Once she opened the door and stepped in, he knew she was there, and he knew she could not exit again. He was not going to get caught. He ambushed her from behind with the stocking. He came over her head. He pulled it tight, pushed her down onto the bed until she lost consciousness and then he tied the ligature off and there was no way for her to escape. There was no heat of the moment. There was no emotion. He killed Danielle because it made his life easier. The jury hears about the prosecution's most damning evidence, Danielle's stolen engagement ring. I had to be the one to testify about the ring because I identified the ring. I actually had to look at that man. I had to sit there and look at him. Calvin Oliver sat there just staring daggers into me is what he did and tried everything he could to make me feel uncomfortable. And I took a big deep breath and uh, I stared right back at him. There was no explanation for the presence of this ring in Calvin Oliver's apartment other than he took it off Daniel Jennings' dead finger. On October 13, 2000, after a five-day trial, the jury delivers their verdict. He was found guilty on all charges. The judge sentences Calvin Oliver to life in prison. When the verdict came through, we were all holding hands. We just knew justice had been served as far as it could be. I mean, we were glad, but it still wasn't going to bring her back. Her mom was never the same again. It destroyed her. That horrible man took away an angel that was put here. She was a huge light to me, to her fiance, to her son. She was everything to a lot of people. I still, to this day, I still dream of her. There's not a day that goes by that I don't miss her.